Welcome back to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rido, joined as always by the great Teddy Atlas. We're going here today for part two of the 25 anniversary, 25 year anniversary of the Michael Mora um, winning his world title with Teddy as his trainer. In part one, against we, the great event, the Holyfield. That's right. In part one, we covered how you were introduced to Michael Mora, and we left off with the psychology of you. You working with Michael, you guys were in camp in, in Palm Springs preparing for the Holyfield fight. And um, I'll let you pick it up from there, Michael. Is just get to the point where he's testing you by calling you the night before a, a run, for instance, and telling you, I'm not going to make it to the run. In other words, like you're not going to call and tell someone the example you used. You're not going to call someone and tell them, hey, I'm going to rob a bank. So he's basically testing you by trying to push you away and see how much you want to be there with him. I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, if he's going to take a risk, he wanted to see if I was going to take a risk with him. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know what I think any human being would want to know. He was, a, he was, he was right. He wanted to know: Can I depend on you? I have to get in a difficult place, a scary place, a squared circle, the chamber of truth, whatever you want to call it, a place where you don't always come out as good as you go in. And he wanted to know if he had his support you're going to tell him to do that he wanted to know if you're willing to take a risk too and um you're willing to walk the walk so to speak and face the things that you're asking him to face in a different way i'm not getting in the ring of fighting he's doing the difficult part but are you real are you real in areas that you're asking me to be real are you again dependable and, and reliable and trustworthy in those areas. He asking me to be strong. Can you be strong? Can I trust you? He lost his, his father left him when he was young. Can can I depend on you? You know, a lot of times when, in the past, when he said he wasn't training or he got out of the ring in the middle of sparring, uh, people, his, his trainers would just say, okay, he's crazy. Um, you know, he doesn't want it, so that's up to you. Go ahead, do what you want. And all of that was out of insecurities, not being sure of himself, whether he could handle what was coming in front of him. We all feel that way We, when we have to do something that's difficult, something that's scary, um, something that's risky, whether it's emotionally risky or physically risky. In this case, it's both. And... You know, we all have our reservations. And, but he wanted to know, he wanted to know if he could depend on you being with him. That, that he's going in there to face what he has to face. And all the insecurities and inhibitions that go along with that kind of situation and task. And he wanted to know if, if you would be with him, if everyone had disappeared in his life. He wanted to know, and now when the trainer says, hey, you want to do that, go ahead. Uh, you're on your own. You don't want to be in shape? You won't be in shape. And that just fed into those, those demons, those doubts of whether or not he could... He can handle this. It just fed into those dark places, those empty places that he truly was not with anyone, nobody. He was alone. Um, it just kind of verified that for him. You know, I told him a story. The first time I met him, I told him a story because I knew his background. If you're going to go into something, you got to be prepared. That's a part of being a pro. And you do your due diligence, and you know what you're going into. You know you're, in this case, I know the fight I'm being asked to train. So I knew about all these things. So I told him a story. I said, I'm going to tell you a story about a guy that was a top fighter. It was based on a true story, uh, a story that Custer told me. I said, I'm going to tell you about a fighter who and he was a middleweight, and he was 
great puncher, uh, undefeated, on his way up, all the things he was. And on his way up, he was he would take off and not train. So right away, I got his attention. Sometimes he would look disinterested, like he was looking off to the side. And But every time I said something that obviously I wanted it to refer to him, and it did refer to him without saying it, I saw that I would get his attention. So I'm talking about this fighter, and I would say in the middle of training, he would disappear. He, he would take off, and then he would go out at night, and he would be seen in different places, you know, in nightclubs, doing all the things you're not supposed to do when you're getting ready for a fight. And then a funny thing would happen. He would go and sneak into the gym at night when nobody was around and do training because he had these demons, these insecurities that we all have, but we don't have to face them the way you have to face them in the ring, the way you have to face them every day if you happen to be a boxer. We get separation from it in other places in life. You don't get that much separation. Everyone has these demons. Everyone has these insecurities, these these shallow spots where we're not sure of ourselves. And wherever it is that we happen to be dealing with, whether it's a teacher going to school and has to be in front of those students and not sure they can bear themselves in front of those students, or you have to do a speech, or you have to run a board meeting, or whatever it happens to be that you have to deal with. But in boxing, it comes to the forefront. It attacks you that much faster because because of the nature of what you're doing, the danger to what you're doing. It's all the other dangers multiplied by a thousand. And you have to understand that. So I'm talking about this fighter and that he would do all these things to show the whole world that he didn't care that he wasn't going to be ready. But then he would go and train at night to be ready because he knew he was going to get in there. And there was a part of him that was scared not to be ready, that wanted to win. But there was a part of him that was so unsure, so out of control, so worried that it would spend a lot of energy and time to set up an alibi, an escape clause. And the reason for it was that this way, if you lost, and we all have these uncertainties, we all have these areas where we're unsure of ourselves. It's just that you never see it. You don't know what the other person is really thinking and feeling unless they show it to you by their behavior. Because if you look at them, they're not going to let you see it. Because if you look at them in the dressing room, they're going to show the macho. They're going to show the positive things, the, the, the confidence. They're not going to know what's inside. But if he quits in the ring, then you're going to know what was inside. But they don't know that you can't see it. That sometimes they think that you can, you can fight a, a person who's going through these insecurities that maybe you can someone could see what they feel so they try to hide it and what they do is they come up nature is ingenious nature's job is not to win it's to survive it's not to drive a good car or have a house in a top neighborhood or to have a bank account that has you know 22 zeros behind it Nature's job is to get you through moments, to let you survive physically and emotionally. So nature's ingenious. You're unsure of yourself. You're facing something that's dangerous, something that's difficult. So it's got to get you through. It's got to find the passageway to, to get you through. So you have to survive, not just physically, emotionally. So what do you do? You, you act like you don't care. So you show the whole world, like this fighter was doing, like Michael Moore was doing. I was talking about Michael, 
but obviously I was using someone else. And I said, so this fighter would do all these things contrary to being a guy ready to win. But yet he would go and do things to get ready to ring when, when nobody was looking. But he wanted everyone to think that he didn't care. Because then if he lost, he was protected. Because if he didn't care, then people couldn't hurt him. Because at the end of the day, if he don't care, we don't care. So you can't say, ah, look, you failed. Look, you were nothing. You thought you were something. You were nothing. And this guy be, no, I didn't care to be something. So you can't attack me. You can't hurt me. Because I didn't care. So there was no ammo for these guys to use against them. Because he was showing you that it didn't matter to him. So he was protecting himself. He was brilliant. He was giving himself that escape hatch from what comes with failure, with the ridicule. With what, what is really the worst part of failure from an emotional standpoint? It's people thinking that you weren't good enough. But if you could say, I didn't want to be good enough, I didn't care about good enough. They can't hurt you in that area. So that's what he was doing. And then one day, I said in a story, one day something happened. And he's looking at me. So what happened? I, I hesitated on purpose. He said, so what happened? I said, he was coming out of the gym late at night after training. And there was an old man there. And the old man said, I know what you're doing. And he said, you don't know nothing, old man. He said, yes, I do. I know what you're doing. He said, old man, you don't know. What am I doing? He said, you're the fighter. You're the fighter. you got a fight coming up. And you're the guy who goes out and plays all this nonsense, silliness, all this nonsense. Like, you know, you're acting the way that a you you're not supposed to be acting out there all the time at night and fooling around with those girls and everything else. But you're in here training where nobody sees you. <laughs> he says, I know what you're doing. He said, you you try to make people think you don't care, but, you know, you do care. He goes, you don't know what you're talking about. Old man. He goes, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if this is a true story, this, yeah. you know, yeah. but it worked. Yeah, It worked. So the old man said, I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to tell everybody what you're doing. You ain't going to tell nobody anything, old man. Yeah, I am. I'm going to tell everybody what you've been doing. So basically, you got a choice now. You got a choice to go in there and, and, and stop this nonsense of, of acting like it don't matter and doing all this stuff to give yourself an excuse, or you go in there and you give yourself a reason to be ready. And so I said, you know, it's just a story I thought I want to tell you. That's all I said. I, I thought I liked it. And he's like, and you know what I knew? I knew I that it struck a chord, obviously. You know, I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. And I understand the psychological part of this game. Because if you only understand X's and O's, you can't really be a good trainer. And so I, I left it like that. And he goes, he didn't want to attend. He said, well, I said, well, what? <laughs> That's it. He said, well, what happened? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, what happened? Did, what happened? Did he win? I said, you're going to train or not? You're going to tra train with me? You're going to train, and these are the rules, and I laid out all the rules. As well. And I never, I never gave him the answer, <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to give him the answer. Yeah. And so that that just, I understood exactly what this journey was and what it had to be. And so when he would, you know, there were, there were times that, again, he just wanted to know that you were there for the journey with him. And when he would, you know, when he, he'd call me up at 1030 at night, I'd be in my room, I'd get the call, I dreaded picking up the phone, but I picked it up. And it would be Michael. And he would say, I'm not running tomorrow. Boom. <laughs> and in the past, you know, it would have been again. 
we talked about it a little bit the last episode. But in the past, it would have been, <laughs> I ain't, I ain't going to worry about it. You know, I'm still getting paid. Yeah. But that would have been, I mean, that would have been dreadful for him. That would have been, I mean, that would have been where he was before. That would have been, yeah, you, nobody does care. You are on your own. Yeah, you're you're being asked to go into this danger zone. You're being able to walk this walk into this dark place, and there ain't no light. You don't have nobody with you, and uh, you know you're being asked to do things. But the risk part of it is not mutual. This guy ain't willing to take the risk. What is my risk? The ri- my risk is l- losing a payday if if I stand up to him too much. Are you willing to take that risk? You want me to take this risk? Will you take that risk? Or are you just a bunch of one-way street hot air? What are you? He was, he was brilliant. He was testing to see what he had. He was It was brilliant. So I had to get out of bed, put on my pants, out of my shoes, sit there for a minute. Man. And, and, and go down... You know, go into another building because we made sure. You know, the 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 thought is that in these camps, the trainer to be right next to a fighter. Yeah, I didn't want to be right next to him. <laughs> be honest, I love Michael. Yeah. I didn't want to be right next to him. I want to be in another building, so I'd have to put my shoes on. You know, that was the funny thing when we were checking in. They say, "So I take it, Mister Moore, Mister um, Atlas will be right next to each other." The manager go, "No, actually, as far as you can get them apart." <laughs> and the, the the administrator would be like uh, at the desk would be like, uh, uh, "All right, okay, uh, uh, all right. Well, here's the blueprint of the you know uh, of the of the resort. Uh, where would you like to be? Well, Mr. Moore is over here. All right, we'll be over here. You know, and you, again, just to have a little separation, a little relief. But at the end of the day, a phone call is only a phone call away. So, yeah. and now I'd have to get and. I'd start walking. Knock on the door. What do you want? <laughs> You're running tomorrow. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. And I wouldn't leave until, you know, until yeah, he was. <laughs> and and he, he needed that. You know, he again, he just needed that assurance that he wasn't alone in this trip. That was a tough trip, tough, tough journey. And there was one day that it got so bad that we started arguing back and forth. And look, he could kick my backside. He was a good, you know, I'd stand up to him and, and I, you know, I'd have to do what I have to do. You know, it got to that point of, of physical confrontation almost, but never really. In reality, no. Because I represented what I represented. I represented for Michael the guide for this journey. And you're not going to kill the guide <laughs> that's going to take you through this jungle Yeah, that has lions and tigers in it. So, and, and he had a respect and a care about that. And so in the end, you know, but it got to the point where it felt physically, it was a physical challenge, you know, and, and there's, there's nervousness because he's, he's about to become the heavyweight champ. So I know He's bigger and stronger, but at the same time, I believe that I don't want to lose myself either. I don't want to lose my own ability to be able to count on myself, to be dependable when I need to be dependable, to be reliable when I need to be reliable, to be significant when I have to be significant, to be real when I got to be real. I got to live with myself, your own dignity, what you think is is something that is dignity, you know, something that is pride. Um, and that's something that you have to have when you're alone, uh, not just when you're in front of people, when you're alone in closed doors. So I had to behave the way I needed to behave, and that was to to truly be ready to confront whatever this would lead to and and do what I had to do to be ready to confront that. And, you know, I was ready if I had to do what I had to do physically. I was ready to do that. 
because if I didn't do it, I was more scared of the way I would feel if I didn't behave the right way than whatever the physical consequences would be for those 10 minutes it would take maybe for him <laughs> to do what he did and me to fight back. Yeah. But I was more worried about how I'd feel and the consequences of those feelings that would stay with me if I didn't stand up for myself mm -hmm. and for what I say that I stood for. And But again, he the reality, we want to be truthful here, the truth is that he was... It, it got to the feeling of it being possible that it could be a physical confrontation. But in the aftermath now of it all, he was always, it was just always him taking it to the the brink, to the edge of the cliff, but never intending to go over that cliff just to see whether or not you were going to jump off that cliff. If you were going to leave, if you were going to not answer the call and there was respect and there was i mean he was a he was he was a good person and um but he was a person that had a reason to be scared and had a reason to the same as everyone but you just don't see it everyone feels it you just don't see it unless they show it to you by their actions so we had this one night where it went back and forth, he had his foot in the door, I'm pushing on the door, you know what I mean? And he's stronger than me, he's bigger than me. You know, all those, I don't contest that. Yeah. But but I'm strong in a way I need to be strong. You know, and that is that whatever it leads to, that's what I'm ready to, I'm willing to face it because I believe this. I believe that that's my job. I'm, I'm not going to be here to get in the ring with a guy who's not ready and say that's his fault, he wasn't ready. No, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. It was my fault. So if it leads to me not being there, that's what it leads to. So he's got his foot in the door, I'm pushing, he's, you know, he, he and I'm, I'm pushing, and finally I force my way in, and maybe he gave in a little, and I get in, and we're, here we are. And he's standing there. What are you going to do? And then finally, again, he could... Uh, it, it would be what it had to be. I would do what I had to do, but in, in the end, he's got the edge, obviously, <laughs> I guess, right? Yeah. But I hope so. <clears throat> Otherwise, I got a problem in the ring with Holyfield, <laughs> yeah. right? I because I ain't, I ain't beating Holyfield. Yeah. So we we get to this point, and then all of a sudden, it's a, it's a moment, and he's a freaking, and he grabs his sneakers, he freaking runs outside the door, and as he's running down the hallway, he's putting his sneakers on, and he, and he starts running. <laughs> he decides to do his own work. Yeah, and he, and he goes out running, and but and and the funny part was the manager. Then I guess somebody <laughs> called the manager up saying, "Hey, <laughs> these two guys that are in separate buildings, they're in the same building, and it's loud." <laughs> And somebody calls somebody, and the manager comes walking down, and he's running right past the manager. He's running down all in, into the night of of Palm Springs. He, he's running out in the parking lot, and and he's and and manager, and a, and a good man. I had problems with him later on, but he's a good man, John Davimos. Yeah. And and he looks at me, and I'm sorry for some of the problems I had with him, but that's that's something I have to own, um. And some he has to own too, for the, but that's that's what that is. That's separate. But um, but I do appreciate that he brought me into his and Michael's life at that point in my life. I, I always appreciate that. Um, and so he comes walking in. Michael goes running past him, and he goes, "What's going on?" And I <laughs> said, "Michael decided to do his road work early," uh, he, and he's like. <laughs> You know, but again, it was, it was part of, it was part of the, what the journey had to be. You know, if, if people can understand this, and and in your own ways, that's, that, I I hope I've said it before, but I hope that that can be some of if there's a goodness or benefit to this show, that can be part of it, part of it, that you've been there before in a different way. But you've been in these tugs of war with yourself. 
All right. As an example, what you described, I do that stuff to my wife all the time. But my wife is like mentally stable. And but to see if she and, really cares about you. Yes, because right? she's mentally stable <clears throat> and secure. Thank God one of you is on. <laughs> but go ahead. And she knows that I have my own struggles emotionally. And luckily, she's always the emotionally stronger person and sees right through my bullshit and eventually like puts the fire out. But I... I'm, I'm aware when I'm doing it, so I can relate to what you're saying because I've been in... Have you ever taken off and done your road work early? <clears throat> Many times. <Yeah. laughs> Many times. But, I mean, so that's, you know, we're speaking to, you know, human things. Yep. You, no matter whether you happen to be a professional fighter fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world, oh my goodness, it's pretty good, pretty big. Or whether you're, you know, a guy going to work in some other capacity. You know, uh, you know, and and you, am, am I good enough? Yeah, you have to ask that question. Am I good enough? Uh, you know, there's some people that they don't take a raise or job improvement or promotion purposely. They undermine themselves. This is what I'm talking about. This was a job promotion, heavyweight championship in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a job promotion. Yeah. But there's people that won't take it because they're afraid of what goes along with it. Mm -hmm. The added responsibilities, the added pressures, the light that's on you. They're comfortable in their place. Yeah, they're earning less. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, all those things are less. But it's comfortable. They're not sure if they can come out of that comfort zone, if they can handle that place, those responsibilities. So they struggle with it. They might even make excuses. No, it, you know, I, they might not make an appointment for interview that could lead to it. Why? Why didn't you make that appointment? Why are you doing this? And and again, it's it's there's subtleties to how you're doing it, but you that's what you're doing because you're afraid of going to that next place. And here, I guess that. So Ken, you can speak to who John Jones is, but this is from. Uh, the Joe Rogan podcast a couple years ago. <clears throat> this is like one of the best UFC fighters, um, maybe of all time in the light heavyweight division. But he talked about how he, one week prior to a fight, would go out and party because if he lost, it was essentially wow. him being able to say, you know, well, it's, be like, it's because I did this or, or however the fight came out, he could always have that as an excuse in his back pocket. So... I can play it here. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, this is amazing. Where I, I would I party one week before every fight. And I did it throughout my whole career. And uh, and this was stupid, but it was this mental crutch that I had. I literally would, one week before every fight, I would go out and I would get blacked out wasted. <laughs> and my logic was, if this guy were to beat me somehow, um, I, I can look myself in the mirror and say that, well, I lost because... I got hammered the week before the fight. So, so it was a built-in safety net. It was a safety net. Yeah, exactly. So I did it my whole career. Like I Joe Rogan, I used to, right? On the, yep. And he is the best at uh, doing this stuff. And that's part of why he's the best, is that he brings stuff like that to light. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And that's shame on me, my own little place of ignorance. But I... Well, I don't follow UFC that much, but I just had no idea that there was an example. Of course, there's got to be examples. That's like saying we're the only life in the universe. There's got to be something else out there we don't mm -hmm. know about with all those planets, <laughs> right? But that's but here, of course, there had to be somebody that would make that confession. Somebody, and there it is. I had no clue that somebody had spoken on that. Somebody as successful as I've heard his name, so I know oh, that he's, he's the best. He's, he's probably a, he's, the best to ever do it. He's, I, and, he's and here he is saying <clears throat> just what we're talking about. So that's what I'm saying. How many of you guys out there, you know, that, again, you had an opportunity to go to that next place, that next place that will benefit you, that will benefit your family. But, again, what comes with it, I get it. It's scary. 
also with regards to the UFC, there was a champ called Rose Namajunas. She um, she was the champ, and she just lost against uh, Amanda Nunes in Brazil. The, the girl who beat her is Brazilian, and they interviewed her after. She's very quiet and um, reflective, uh, Rose, the, the champ who lost. And when they interviewed her after, she said that she was actually felt relieved. She felt relieved that she didn't have the pressure of being the champ anymore. She wanted to continue fighting, and she was winning the fight, and she got caught. But she was like, I have a huge sense of relief now. Like, I want to keep fighting, but I don't like the burden of being the champion. It is. It, listen, it's a pressure. And, but with, you know, the great thing about pressure is that it's there for a reason. Pressure truly when you've been around a while, is a privilege that you're in a position to have pressure. Mm -hmm. But you got to get to that place where you can understand that and you can deal with that and you can realize that. Yep. Because <coughs> some people are in a place in life where there is no pressure because they're at that place where there are no expectations. Yep. But see, I would argue that there is a pressure that there's a different kind of more silent, more subliminal pressure for those people. It's the pressure of one day realizing what if. I so I think that's a horrendous thought almost. I agree. You know? And um you want to try to avoid those those places, those things, if you can have the capacity to do that. And so Michael wasn't alone, which that just showed, mm -hmm. but he felt alone. And so we, you know, we went through this tug of war with these different forces back and forth every day. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, we would do, and, and the camp got to play. I didn't want it to be that way, but it was entertainment for these people. They they, they would pay a dollar to come watch a workout, right? <laughs> I think it was a dollar that Rivera said, uh, Riviera, they all put it on the tennis court, they put a, a tent up, and I think they charged them a dollar, whatever. And the place would, it started off a decent crowd. By the time they started getting a, uh, a load of our act, it was packed. It was like standing room, <laughs> Uh, people waiting to get in because they started seeing, oh, this stuff's pretty good stuff here. They, because some of this stuff would just bleed out in front of them. I didn't want it to, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Some of this stuff would just bleed out in, in, in broad daylight and, and outside of the privacy of what you would hope to keep it in the privacy of our lives. Yeah. And I mean, there was a day, there was a, there was a day where I, I don't allow music because I want concentration. If you're a lawyer getting ready for a case, you got music blasting? No, I don't think so. And if you're, if I'm, if I'm your client and I come in, you got music, I think I'm getting another lawyer. Okay? I want you concentrating. Really? You're a doctor getting ready to do surgery. You got the Rolling Stones blasting? No, I don't, no, no, I don't want that. So we're, we're in a, you know, respect where we are. We're in a workplace. We're teaching. We're learning. We're working. It's important. Uh, no music. But I would allow music after we were done the workout, doing the exercise. And Michael loved music. I like music too. We just have different tastes. Mm -hmm. And so Michael puts on, one day we're there, Michael puts on, he's got his guys with him, all good guys. And put on, decides to put on this, uh, this gangster rap stuff. I don't know if it was Tupac or whoever it was, but it was, you know, there was a lot of, you know. Carson. Yeah. You know, a lot of words that started with M and F. <laughs> All right? <laughs> and, you know, and it's going, and I'm, oh, oh, are you kidding me? And But I look around, there's, there was a woman in the in the audience, some children, you know, their fathers brought their kids to get an autograph afterwards or whatever. Yeah. And, and so I immediately went over there and shut it off, you know? <laughs> and he's looking at me, what are you doing? What am I doing? I'm shutting off this music. You, you didn't see I'm putting, he went to put it back on, boom, I just turned on. And I think there might have been a day, might have been a day. And again, oh, because he's a, I got to, it, it might have been a day I actually, because it was during the day where there were cassette tapes still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it might have been a day where I might have 
stepped on a cassette <laughs> tape. <laughs> I might have broken it. And and it was and here's the audience. Can you imagine? And you get to a place where you're in the tunnel. You don't realize, yeah, 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 you know. Yeah. So I'm just in this place with him. It's me and him. And and I forget that we're in front of all these hundreds of people that paid a dollar. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't want to be. You know, I didn't know that we were going to become the you know the David Letterman show. Yeah. You know, and and here we are. So I I smashed this tape, and he, he said, "You just smashed my tape." Yeah. For just doing your sit-ups and, you know, we're not listening to them. And, then we're, you know, we're, it's not it's not good. But, again, there was a reason, you know, and then, uh, you know, and he's a good person, Michael, a special person. But, you know, then then he realized, you know, I, I think I said this kid's here, you know. I don't want to get into a whole thing, but you know, it's not, we're not doing it. And so then, anyway, comes down. We we finished doing the exercise, and and then you know we're not talking to each other. So the crowd's watching this; they they they're just they're absorbing all this, and we're we're not talking to each other. And then all of a sudden he says, "So what kind of freaking music you like?" I said, "Um, I don't know, like Summer Wind, <laughs> uh, Beyond the Sea, uh, Frank Sinatra. What is that?" <laughs> I said, "What is Frank Sinatra? Are you kidding me?" <laughs> What, 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 beyond, what is, uh, look, the summer wind. He said, yeah, that's what I like. Anyway, finish doing your push-ups. So we get finished, right? Unbeknownst to me, and this is where, this is, it's just a special kid. You know what I mean? But we, we were both do. sometimes a parent takes on that kind of role. Yeah. And a trainer is a parent. Yep. It's a surrogate parent. You're responsible. For what happens to your fighter, your kid, and um, sometimes it means some of these kind of things, you know, not exactly that, but whatever. So, unbeknownst to me, Michael goes driving into the desert looking for summer wind cassettes. <laughs> he had to go to like I don't know how many towns. And so the next day, now now the crowd's bigger because they heard people called up, and you got to come see this stuff. I guess you know yeah, this stuff is pretty. <laughs> you got to see what's going on over here. So the next day, here we are, and, and it gets time for the, you know, and you could actually, it comes time for exercise, and the music is going to come on, you know, he's going to put on the music. And uh, you can see people like, this should be interesting. <laughs> here we go. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> puts it on. What do you got? Summer winds came blowing in <laughs> from across the sea. And you didn't know he was going to do it. No idea. <clears throat> oh, the autumn wind <laughs> is sitting there. Still. <laughs> you know, I don't know the lyrics. And it was just like, you know, <laughs> I just looked at him. <laughs> I said, now, now you've finally got a taste for good music. <laughs> you know, and 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 we were back, we were back in the right place. So, you know, it was. We finally got to a place about. There was a fight before the fight. I think I made that clear. The first fight was for him to know if he had somebody who was going to stick with him, that he could trust, to actually be in a fight with him, to actually be to deal with something with him to actually be there and all of a sudden we got to a place i don't remember if it was two weeks before the fight or 10 days before but a short period before the fight we got to a place where all i can tell you is that john davamos after a couple of days john davamos came over to me the manager and he said where did that did you see that last night i said see what you know the spaceship he said, spaceship. We are out in the desert, you know. I said, spaceship. He goes, yeah, the spaceship that came with the aliens and replaced Michael. <laughs> so what are you talking about? He goes, that ain't Michael. I said, it is now. Because like for three days in a row, he couldn't be more perfect. And John didn't understand it. And I said, he said, what, how, what do you, how do you explain it? He said, tomorrow he'll probably change. Maybe today it'll be back to the same stuff. I said, no, it ain't changing. He was doing everything perfect. 
And so John looked at me and said, how do you explain that? I said, because he finally trusts me that I'm going to stay there for the right reasons. I'm going to, I, I passed the test. And now he's, he's secure with that. And he ain't, he, this is what we're going to have the rest of the way now. Because now he finally bought in to reasons why we have the things we need to do to be ready instead of things to prepare to have an excuse to fail. Things that we need to do now to be ready to win instead of filling the room with things to protect ourselves to lose. He's he's now at a place where he trusts he trust that I'm with him and he's going to stay in that place now. And he's a genius. He's a genius. And John said, how? how? What do you mean? I said, because now he's put it all on me. <laughs> because now he said, and listen, understand that. Michael's doing everything. I'm not making myself any kind of, you know, when he realized you kind of when he realized you weren't going to leave, he's like, "Okay, you want to stay? No, now no. it's all on you." Yeah, now it was like what was ingenious about it. And again, I'm I'm no martyr, I'm no hero. What I'm saying is, I'm making a point of human nature. It, he said, "Now I'm doing what you said, and then you asked me to do. I trust you. Now it's on you to deliver. It better be right. We better win." <laughs> I'm going to do every. He didn't say that. I but, know what you mean. But I said he switched it around here. He's a genius. I said, now it's like, I'm I'm not making no excuses. I'm leaving no parachute, no no escape clause. Now I'm in. I, I'm in. Now you deliver. Yeah. Now, now it better work out the way you said it will because I'm, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Now it's on you. And I said, he relieved. He found a way to switch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. To flip flop the pressures. <clears throat> it's just a genius. Just because we need these things just to get through. We need whatever. We need whatever little rowboat might be there in our lives to get us upstream, past whatever that piece of water might be. That we need to get past, we 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 all need it, and he found that one. How long before the fight was it that he started to kind of shift? Ten the days, maybe maybe two weeks, maybe ten days. There was a day when it really when I knew it was there. He, I had him hitting a heavy bag, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he says to me, he says, uh, "Tell me," he says, uh, "Tell me what to do." So, you know, I just said, well, keep doing what you're doing. You use your jab, you, you know, use the jab, uh, work off the jab. He goes, tell me why I'm going to win. Tell me why I'm going to win. I said, you're going to win because you're going to out-jab him. You're going to win because you're going to disrupt his offense. You're going to win because you, because you want to win. You're going to win because you refused to do anything else. And he said, tell me how I'm going to do it. And then he would repeat himself. And you're going to do it, you know, and then I would go down that road. And it was really, I mean, it was, it was beautiful. I mean, it was just him making, it was him being naked, saying, just coming out and saying, okay, I'm not behind any of these masks anymore. I'm not behind the shelter of any of these things anymore. I'm exactly what you asked me to be now. Vulnerable. I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable. That's right, baby. I'm, but, but I'm ready to win. I'm ready to freak vulnerability and everything. I'm ready to put it out there and tell me, tell me how it's going to happen. I, I want to see it. See it with me. Show it with me. Sing it with me. <laughs> yeah. And, um, it was it was just that moment. It was one of those moments. And uh he's a special guy, a special person with all this stuff that we're talking about, but uh he's just, he is and you know, we all have our weaknesses and stuff, but not all of us have some of the strengths that he had too. You know. Some of us never had that. And um 
once that was brought out, it was it was something to see and it was something to acknowledge. And it was something that made him heavyweight champ of the world on that night. Where was the fight? It was at Caesar's Palace uh, in the parking lot. They, they Back in those days, Caesar's Palace would turn their parking lot into an arena, outdoor arena. Was there a, um, a fight which took place at night, so there was no... HBO. No, but but there was no um, roof over it, right? No, it's outside. It doesn't rain in Vegas. Right. You know, for the, really. I mean, during that part of the season, obviously. And um, But I mean, for the undercard, they're not fighting on, are they fighting on yeah. the sun? Uh, no, well, that's a good point. Um, some of them might be touching the sun, uh, you know, some of the early fights. Yeah, mm-hmm. it could be tough. But it wasn't at the point where Vegas, just like Palm Springs, uh, it wasn't that 120 degree oh, weather gotcha. yet. You know, we were there, we planned when we were going to be there, and we were there before that. The weather was starting to get warmer, but we were there before it got to that place. Gotcha. You know, it was 80s instead of hundreds. How soon before the fight did you arrive in Vegas? A week before, because that's the customary time. That's uh, kind of the demanded time by the promotion to get out there to promote the fight. You know, and you you got all the seasons, probably you got the... You got the Caesar sentryman. Uh, you got Caesar meeting you. You got the red carpet that's put out. You got to go through all that stuff. Yeah. You know, that's how they promote the fight, especially a heavyweight title fight with a Vander Holyfield. Oh, yeah. You know, and so you go out there and Caesar meets you and you walk the red carpet and, you know, and of course I was looking for Brutus. <laughs> you know, there's always a Brutus. <laughs> there's always a Brutus in life, yep. unfortunately, right? And of course, I'm kidding. I was around good people. I was fortunate, and um, so you got that whole week, and you worry about that week because everything's good up to that point. Seven weeks in training camp, and now you got this last week where you really are very on edge that nothing goes wrong to throw it off from a mental standpoint or. You know, obviously a physical standpoint. Like the old timers would say to me, and that's who I respect and who I was always around, but with cuss, but it's all over but the shooting. Yeah. You know, now now, yeah. now you've done all the work, you've done every now now it's a matter of just staying sharp. Uh the condition if you're not in shape by now, you got a problem. Oh yeah. You did something wrong. So now it's a matter of just staying where you need to stay, but mentally keeping the focus, uh keeping the ninjas from coming over the walls the imagination mm-hmm. because the imagination can do it can destroy you mm-hmm. because there's no limit on imagination there's limit on reality reality is reality it's a limit the imagination if you let it run amok you let it run wild it can take you anywhere it can take you to dangerous places so you want to keep your fighter from going to those dangerous places so you so and you don't want to smother them. You don't want to drown them. You drowned them already in training camp, you know. So you don't want to drown them with the right? now. Now you you want to keep them loose. And sometimes you know, sometimes just uh, know when it's time to to do something light, uh, light uh, mentally and emotionally, uh, and and comforting and with family with with the because your unit has become family in that camp. You're sharing a lot of things there. What kind of things would you do the week of the well, fight? Well, I mean, we go take walks. We might go to the mall. You know, we we uh, of course we're doing training every day, but light training. You know, just to stay sharp. Technique, going over the game plan, kind of like football teams that do walkthroughs. I do walkthroughs. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what we're going to expect, and we walk through it. You know, and all those things, and. Um, you know, it was funny. Like I said, we were getting closer. John, John would come every once in a while. John would come by and say, has the alien shown up? Uh, has the real Michael been replaced by the alien? I said, no, I told you. That ain't happening. I told you what it is. He he, he knows exactly what he, what he did and what he's doing. I said, hey, we got him. We got him. We got the real guy here. And he's going to stay that way. It ain't changing. So, you know, we would go, we'd go out to... Uh, you know, just to relax, do different things. So the night before, uh, decided to take him and his crew to a movie. And, you know, it was funny because 
I just want him to be relaxed. I don't want him thinking too much about the things that I don't want to think about. We've done that already. It's there. We're ready. So I just want to relax. So me, Mike Borman, the PR man who later on married uh, Lou Duva's daughter, he, he worked for Main Events, which was our promoter. And... <coughs> And he was he was there in camp with me. He was a good guy and a friend, and so he's with me. And he knows, you know, it, it's good to have someone you can share with what's going on. He knows the workings uh, behind the curtain that's going on, you know. So he's familiar with everything. So we decide we're going to go a movie. So uh, I tell Michael pick a movie, and he picks a movie, the worst movie I ever saw in my life. <laughs> Oh, my God. What movie was it? Oh, my God. I, it was a movie. All I know is Ice-T was in it. And, <laughs> and, and and like, all I know is a lot of people died. Put it this way. Michael Borman says, you know, it's not like he's going to Cisco and Egbert. Back in those days, those were the movie, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, the reviewers. The movie reviews, and you get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. He goes, the way Michael, well, Michael Borman was very funny. Yeah. And he said, the way Michael, you know, judges a movie and rates a movie is by body count. <laughs> How many people die? And uh, a lot of people die, apparently, in this movie. <laughs> so so it's four, it's four thumbs up. We're going. So I said, whatever he wants. Whatever you want, Mike. Is that what you want to say? Yeah. All right. We'll go. So we go in there. And I'm, I'm really, Michael Borman's watching me, you know, and I go in with his crew, about five guys, four guys, whatever it was. We go in, all good guys, retired policemen, uh, most of them from Detroit uh, that he had been around for years, just good men. And so we're all going in there, and uh, I'm like, the, I'm buying popcorn for everybody. I'm, I'm buying popcorn. Here, here's your popcorn. Here's your store. You know, and we're, we're going in. We got the roll, and, every, and they're talking, and they're saying, oh, you, that, you, he got that guy. Yeah, <laughs> whoa, whoa. Yeah, you know, and I turn around. I turn, like, for a second. I turn, and I see Borman. Borman's like, oh, how much longer is this? <laughs> is, it, is it almost over? You know, and um, it, it's just the one. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't surviving the game, though. Oh, no. Well, no, no, it was. Go back to that. It, well, because what it was about, it was about they were hunting human beings. So maybe that's what it was. What it was about, <laughs> it was about these rich guys that would take these people off the street, like like a guy living on the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? Like yeah. a homeless person. Yeah, like a homeless person. He would take them off the street. Ice-T was that guy. And he would take them off. There it is. They, oh, that, that was... Uh, this, this is the movie. And and what they did was they... Oh, my God. <laughs> and and, not, and no Academy Award, by the way. I mean, <laughs> no... no. You see enough, right? Yeah. No, I mean, it, no, it didn't... It didn't win best picture, but <laughs> but it did the job. You know what I mean. But they took him to a camp. These rich people took these guys, these homeless guys. I say took them to a camp, and they thought they were going to be treated good, and they were going to do some hunting. And, and yeah, they were right. They were going to be the thing they didn't get told was they were going to be hunted. <laughs> They were going to be put out in this woods and they were going to be given a, a hour, two hour, three hour head start and then they were going to be hunted. <laughs> so by these wacko freaking people with money. So um, that's it. That's that's what. So, you know, I'm, I'm watching this and, and whoa. They, and, you know, like I said, I look at Borman and Borman's like, what happens? <laughs> and so it was it was good. I mean, it was. And then there was again. You got to keep your eye on everything, you know. And that w that worked for the night. And then uh, for the last week, I would always have meals with him. I always wanted to eat with him. I didn't want him to eat alone. Want to be with him. And um, so we and he did too. So we would eat our meals together. Uh, we're gonna have breakfast at this time. We're gonna have dinner at this. You know, then we would we get together. We'd eat together, and we'd eat in his room. Uh, the last few days, you know, we'd stay in the room, and we uh, we would, uh, it, you know, the I remember the the morning of, I come to his room to to get him up for breakfast, and no, it, it wasn't the morning. Of, was it the morning of? It was. It was no. It was a couple days before actually. It's a couple days before. And I come in the room to have breakfast with him. It was a few days before. 
and I noticed that he'd been up already. He's in the room, and he'd been sitting up doing whatever for already for you know a little bit of time. But I noticed all the drapes were still closed. It was like pitch black in there. I made like a joke. I said, "Where are you?" I figured, <laughs> oh, "What are you, Dracula?" Yeah. yeah so yeah. so he goes, "Well, I'm here. Why?" And all of a sudden, I knew what it represented. Again, you have to understand what you have to understand if you're in the place where you're going to do your job. In this place, you know what it was. He darkness was was hiding. It represented hiding. It represented not having to see, not having to think. I couldn't have that at this point. We had to be ready to see, mm-hmm. ready to think, ready to know. So I, I recognized it right away. So I come in and I start pulling all the curtains back. And it was funny. He, and Michael goes, oh, oh, whoa, shut that. What are you doing? Yeah, well, close those. And he started like covering his eyes, you know, because the yeah, sun yeah. came in. I said, hey, Dracula, uh, Dracula, it's okay. It's not, the sun's not going to burn you up, <laughs> Dracula. And he goes, oh, shut those. What are you doing? Shut those curtains. I said, and I said, I, I almost, I think I remember almost verbatim. I, I kept pulling them open. Because he had a beautiful suite in Caesar's Palace, yeah, showing you know a great view, and I open it all up, and the sun, the whole room lights up, and I say, no, 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 you've done too far. You haven't hidden one day. There's no hiding. There's 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 no darkness. There's nothing but light. There's no darkness. There's no time for not seeing things. You haven't hidden one day. And he just got quiet. And he let me talk. I said, you haven't hidden one day in camp. There's not one day you missed road work. There's not one day you missed a curfew. There's not one day you missed a round of sparring. There's not one day you missed a round of heavy bed. You, ain't, you saw everything and you were ready to see everything. You're going to see the rest of this to your heavyweight champ. And he, you know, that's what he needed to hear. You know, that was it. And did he did he say anything or just listen? No, he just, I he, you know he listened and basically was uh, yeah, okay. Sometimes he kid with me. He goes, "All right, boss," <laughs> you know, like, or uh, sometimes he would call me pop, you know, okay. "Okay, pop," you know. But but I think again, uh, you know, special kid, yeah, you know, special person. You don't become heavyweight champion of the world if you're not special. Yeah, and you're not, and especially against Holyfield. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, yeah, he just, you know, he. That, it was time to hear that. How was the banter back and forth between him and Holyfield? I would imagine they were pretty respectful. respectful. I mean, Michael's a respectful person, and Michael and Holyfield, of course, is Holyfield, who's not to put a, resp- a man. Yeah, that's why he beat Seems Tyson. Like I know we're not on that subject now, but uh, he was too much man for Tyson. People mm-hmm. say this, that. No, no, no. F- too much man. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's at the end of the day. That's why he beat him even when he was at a point in his career where people thought he was past his prime yeah, and didn't have enough left physically. But he did. But it was one thing that he always had enough. Manhood. Man, uh, the ability to behave like a man. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in that kind of way that we're, we're implying, we're talking about. But, uh, no, it was... It was all good. I mean, it was there, there was a time during the press conference where they were playing on Michael's bad boy image. So he came in with army fatigues. I was the only one who wouldn't put it. You know, I wasn't. I just stayed off. <laughs> you didn't want to go in costume. I stayed off on the side, you know. <laughs> and they came in army fatigues. And they had the podium. And the dude was a real smart. Dan Duva, God bless him. Uh, God rest his soul. He, he he was a great promoter. And, and Lou and all of them. And so they had this thing set up, you know. Where he comes in and he, they're playing the bad boy thing. He comes in with the, all, you know, like with the army fatigues and the shades on and, and his crew. And they come in, he comes up to the podium and <laughs> he hits the podium and the podium falls apart. <laughs> I and, remember and, that. Do you remember that? And, and I'm, in, I'm in the back and I look at Holyfield and Holyfield's laughing. Like Holyfield's <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, you know, like. Like it, it felt too easy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It was, you know, it, <laughs> it was held together by scotch tape. Yeah, I mean, it was like you didn't even have to hit it that hard, and it was like exploded. But um, 
I felt I was I, I don't know if I said something to Holly Cook, but I remember looking at him. He was like, <laughs> like, like almost like embarrassed <laughs> that that we were doing this. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and uh, you know, I I don't think I said anything, but I was I was tempted to say, "You scared? <laughs> <laughs> scared yet? <laughs> Worried?" Uh, that's funny. Yeah. Talk to me about the day of the fight. Like, what's what? What is the process? Anything special with Michael out of the ordinary that you wouldn't do with someone else? Or that well, you I mean, to? it's the eating at the times you want to eat and getting carbs, complex carbs. And most of the carbs that you're going to use that night were, were gotten the day before, mm -hmm. you know, the night before. So now it's a matter of eating stuff that's not going to upset his stomach, that he's comfortable with, but uh, are the right things to eat. But that that will be, you know, uh, fuel for the fight. But most of the fuel's there already. But fuel for the fight and... Uh, that that you're eating at the right hours, the right time where you have time to digest it, and again you're eating the things that there's there's no risk, you know you're you're not getting a bad piece of fish, you're not getting mm -hmm. you know the and uh, you're getting plenty of fluid. I want to make sure he's hydrating during the day, especially in the desert. Hydrating, hydrating, hydrating. You're going to take a trip. We're taking a trip, right? You're going to take a trip. Uh, you better make sure there's water in the radiator, right? Mm -hmm. So the body's no different, you know, and uh, so. You're doing that, and I'm, I'm leaving water with him. I know he would say, "I know, drink." You know, I say, "Keep drinking, keep drinking during the day." Water, 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 and uh, be with him for the meals, and and just uh, you know, let him rest, let him uh, let him get a nap uh, if you get a nap because you might not have slept perfect the night before. Yeah. You think about some stuff. Oh yeah, I know. You know, I remember there was a little touchy thing, like you know, kind of like this is inside people who don't get to see, you know. But before he went to bed, you know, I want to make sure that all because the friends they mean well, but they can do damage. Yeah. So you want to keep uh, you want to keep control over that. I don't want to be a, you know, a dictator till the hun. Yeah. But 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 uh, maybe you know. I mean, sometimes you have to be what you got to be, but. I, but at the same time, I know what's on the line here. They didn't. They don't know. They don't. They haven't invested in what I've invested in. He's invested in. So they come in from wherever they're flying in the night. Hey, and, and, and stay up to one in the morning and then shoot the. No, I'm saying that's. Don't think that 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 can't happen. But it ain't happening. But why is it not happening? Because you're gonna make sure it don't happen. But don't think that can't happen. Yeah. Because they, people are selfish innately. No, no, with, oh, for sure. well, without thinking of it, they're not saying I'm being selfish. Mm. But they're thinking of what what fits for them, what what's convenient for them at the moment. And then they're thinking, I'm just talking. They're not thinking that he should go to bed at 9 o'clock. He's got something a little important tomorrow. <laughs> right? Yeah. 12 rounds with Evander Holyfield. Yeah. But they're not thinking. So they're, they're, they're just thinking of themselves. That's human nature. Yeah. So you got to make sure, hey. So I go to his guys and go, get him out of here. Get him out of here. You know, and we get him out and by 8 o'clock, whatever, 7.30, whatever time I wanted to quiet down. I wanted them there to the point that he was relaxed and that he wasn't drowned with things he was drowned with. I didn't want it during camp. I didn't want him drowned with with the things he already knew. We were, That was in. That was ready. That was set. Now I want him to get a little separation of that so i want him to be relaxed i want to make sure it was the right guest list i wanted to make sure the right people i would ask the manager this guy said wants to come up to the room is, is this the right guy no he no this ain't the right guy <laughs> no you don't want him there. all right get him out of here uh but this guy yeah he grew up with this guy this guy yeah. is comfortable all right he's in you know really yeah so so you you you're controlling everything really you, you gotta it's too much on the line so you're controlling everything, every aspect of it. You you didn't go this far to screw up. Mm -hmm. That's the fear of me. I don't want to make sure everything's right. So you want the balance. You want them to relax, but you don't want it to be what it could be counterproductive, what could be hurtful. So we get him out of there. We get the right people up there. He's relaxed, and then I get him out at the right time. And then it's time. And... uh it was, you know, funny. I, I go into his room. I say, "All right, let me tell you a bedtime story." What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, kidding around. But no, I'm going to tell you because it's a big, it's a big moment for you too. Yeah. Because you're yeah. you're training the potential heavyweight champion of the world. You want to win for yourself as well as for him. No, so you know you, what it was. You're right. I have been told since I started this journey with Cus 
that you're going to train heavyweight champ of the world. This was supposed to happen. You're going to train heavyweight champs. You're the young master. Whatever crap. But it's what Cuz had to tell me yeah. to keep me going. You're the young man. You train heavyweight champs of the world. And, you know, here it is. And, you know, and now it's there. But we both had missions. Michael's mission was to keep the devil from the door, to allow himself to be what he could be. It was to find himself. It was to finally face what he had to face and find out what he could be in this realm. And to find something that had been lost, something that he didn't trust, that he, a belief that he was worthy. Because when your father leaves you and when other people leave you, you start to wonder on some level if you're worth it. So this was a journey to know that he was. And for me, it was a journey to validate what my father did for me, allowing me to go up to Catskill for those years, all those years, um, and paying my room and board $200 a month, or $200 a, $200, no, it was 50 a week, $200 a month, $50 a week, pretty good deal back in those days. But still, it was back in those days, everything's relevant. It was still 200 a month, and I didn't have it. <laughs> And my father did that and gave me this chance, you know. So this was what it was for Michael. And for me, it was to say thanks to my dad and to have a graduation that you don't get coming out of a boxing college. You know, uh, you Kids go away to college, and the payback to their parents is they get a graduation day where you wear those gowns and you throw those flat hats up in the air. And, you know, I didn't go to college. I went to Catskill, New York, and, you know, to train heavyweight champs. And my father died just before that happened. And... You know, he never, he never, he never got to see. You know, he never got to see the graduation, you know, of that day. So for me, this was that that graduation day. For you know that you hope that he can see, you know that he's, you know, you believe in those things that he. Sometimes you have to believe in those things that he would be able to see. You know what this was all for and then we got to the right place and you know and this this was that graduation day so that's what it was for me and it was what I described for Michael so we both had our own you know reasons and what this was tied into and um, and that's that's all it was tied in for me and so it was funny because I'm, I sent him to bed, and then I went downstairs to to uh, meet some family that was flying in, my brother, uh, some family that was flying in the last minute. So I'm standing, I want to go to bed early too, but I'm downstairs, you know, it's still early enough, and I'm downstairs before the elevator bank, and, you know, it was, the word gets out, it's funny, because I'm a young trainer in the business, but... I had already trained um, a lot of fighters, you know, and um, I've been training them since a very young age. You know, I mean, I got the benefit of training the Wilfredo Benitez when I was like 21 years old. I didn't deserve that, but it was because, so I got that opportunity. And he was the youngest champion in the history of the sport, 17. That had never be surpassed. And he won three weight classes, junior welterweight, welterweight, and junior middleweight. And I trained him for when he won the welterweight title against Palomino. He was up in Catskill. And so I 
I had already worked with. I didn't deserve it, but it was with Cus, so I, I, I was given that opportunity because of that. I had to earn the rest of it. And so I was training all kinds of fighters, good fighters, and but never getting paid for it, never it was just part of my apprenticeship. It was it was part of my, you know, it was part of my final test in college. It was part of my term papers. It was part, you know, Jim Jacobs would send the guy up uh, to cuss and I would train him. And I was training all these pros during the day and amateurs at night. I was in the gym seven days a week. That's it. I was every Friday or Saturday, whatever day it was. I think it was Friday. It might have been Saturday. But every Saturday there were, there were smokers down in the Bronx. So I would take the kids that I trained to get experience. I would take them down to the smokers in the Bronx to get the experience, to fight. And then come back and get back at 3 in the morning. And then go to the gym the next day. And there were, there were no Sundays off. Cus didn't believe in that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, so I... I'm, I'm, I'm in a, you know, we're, we're at this, we're just at this place now where it all came down to this. And the stories had, you know, because of what I just described, it was out there that I've been training fighters all these years and He's this young trainer, protege of custom model, and he's his day is here. It just kind of came out like like there there was a writer. There was actually a writer. I think it was for the. I think it was for the Daily News, and a, a good writer, a very good writer. And he got he got to know me, and he got around me, and. He actually asked the editor of the newspaper, can I go out to Vegas for the week and follow Teddy and do a story every day? Because here's the story. Here's the kid that went up there. He was in trouble. He was a wayward kid. His father sends him up to Catskill with this legendary hermit, a uh, guy that became <laughs> a, basically a hermit custom model yeah. that was uh, in, in exile from the world to a certain extent. And... and he was always told he was going to have the heavyweight champ and he goes through this whole journey and then, you know, he leaves because of Tyson and the whole situation. He leaves Catskill, he goes on his own and, you know, his father made all these things possible and, uh, you know, he was always looking and vying for his father's love and affection and always trying to get it. Then his, uh, And then he gets the heavyweight title, his father dies and and now here he is at that place, the heavyweight title. And it's all wants to show the father that it was worthwhile and that the journey is complete. And he said, I want to follow the story. He said, he asked the editor, and the editor wanted, if my memory's correct, the editor wanted him to do the final four in the NCAA basketball championships, I believe. And so he was like, no, I think, and the writer was like, no. I know that's a big story, you know, it's the NCAA, of course it's huge. But he said, this is huge, for me. I want to do this. I want to show this story. And I want to follow the end of it. And this is before you're doing any work on ESPN, so you're still yeah. relatively unknown. Yeah, this is, I, I just started working on ESPN a little after that. Okay. And, and so, so here, yeah. A little after that, two a year after that, two years after that, whatever it was, and so he talks the editor into letting him go out to Vegas. So here he is; he's in Vegas for the week, following this whole thing and and documenting a story every day, a story in the Daily News every day. And the Daily News was big; newspapers were bigger yeah, than, yeah, yeah, than they are now. Now yeah. it's, it's this. What's this thing? It's uh, <laughs> what is it? The, the interwebs, the internet, right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the internet. right. The internet, and <clears throat> so I heard about that. <laughs> so now we got the story. So the the point is that everyone is familiar with this journey to a certain extent, especially in boxing. So they're all 
everyone's waiting to see what happens. Well, every, yeah, everyone's waiting to see the end of the movie. Yeah. So I'm I'm here. I am waiting for my family and for different people to come, and I'm down by the elevator, and everyone's coming through. I don't know who they are, but they're all coming through. Good luck. Good luck. Congratulations, Teddy. Congrat. And it's making me. It's making me not just nervous and scared, but it's making me angry. No, you know, the part that's making me angry is that they're saying, some of them are saying, not meaning to, but some of them are saying congratulations just because you got there. Because they read the story. And they mean well, some of them. But they don't understand. It means nothing if we don't win. It's almost worse. If we don't win, my, you know, my father doesn't get to graduation. And, um, you know, this is all for nothing. So there is no getting there, you know, moral victory. So anyway, so they're saying, good luck, good luck, congratulations. And I'm, you know, and I'm standing there and it's, it's like a procession line. It's just, people just keep coming up to me. <laughs> and finally, this one, you, you're shaking hands without looking. And this one guy puts his hand out there, and um, I don't look, and I shake it, and then I hear the voice. Congratulations. Again, I don't want to, but I hear this voice. I look, and it's it's this guy um, who had betrayed me as a fighter, Donnie Lalonde. Oh, yeah, I remember from the and, book. And, yeah, and I don't want to go into the story. No, 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 no. But the truth is he did. Yeah. You know, I mean, any other way, I know there's always two sides to a story, right? His, yours, and then the truth. I get it, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so I threw his hand away. Like, I, I realized I, you know, I, I touched something I didn't want to touch. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I didn't look. Always look before you shake someone's <laughs> hand. And I was like, uh, you know, and then... um. I think I even said to him, so silly, right? But we're silly, aren't we? Sometimes when we want to protect our feelings. I, I said, I didn't see it was you. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know? And um, so I, I'm looking at him and he starts walking away. And he says, congratulations. I said, I, I got like a little, you know, very upset. Yeah. I said, for what? I, we didn't do nothing yet. We didn't do nothing yet. There is no freaking... What are you saying congratulations for? We didn't freaking do nothing yet. Yeah. And he said, you got here. He's yelling. He's like down the hall now. But you got here. I said, it don't mean nothing. What the frick is... You know, and I'm like, people are looking at me like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and, I, you know, I... Uh, then somebody that I cared about would come along and say, Teddy, come on. You all right? Yeah. I said, the freaking guy... Freaking congratulations. For what? We didn't do freaking anything. We didn't do nothing. He goes, don't worry, don't worry. So, you know, and then um, I over 100 people from Staten Island, maybe 120 people flew in. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, and I went and I made up my mind, I'm going to buy 120 tickets. <laughs> you know, but but not ringside. <laughs> You know? Yeah, no kidding. But but still, you know, still whatever. I think the cheapest ticket might have been a hundred. Yeah. You know, uh, I think. You know, uh, face yeah. price. Face, no, no, I think it was. Face value whatever. on the tickets. Now I, I bought it. I tried to buy a ticket. For, I think just about for everybody, you know. Then, of course, I had the tickets that the manager, we, we always have a deal. I get a certain amount from my family. Yeah. The rest you buy. Yeah, yeah. You know, and... um so I had my family all sitting there. I remember there was seven hundred dollars seats back in those days. That was mm -hmm. sort of high back in those oh, days. Yeah. You know, it was ringside. And and then the locker room, the night we go to the locker room, I remember make going through my list. I want to make sure everything's right. I don't want to miss nothing. So I said, bring music and let him have his. I don't care how many M's and F's <laughs> <laughs> are in it. I don't care. Whatever he wants. Let him have the music he wants. And you know what he chose? He chose um he chose like Beethoven. I mean not Beethoven, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. But but he, he something he chose clean. something a little different, you know? And um like I said, he's a special person <clears throat> in his own right. But he so we get there and I got and I'm looking for anything I can grab onto. I'm so alert like your 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 whole life for this. So I I don't want to miss nothing. 
So I'm, I'm looking for anything. And then all of a sudden I'm watching the monitor of a fight that's going on in the ring. And a friend of mine trained the guy, a good friend. And unfortunately, but it, it, it was for a reason. I had to use it. He's losing, he's losing his title. He's losing his title, and it's right there. So all of a sudden, boom, I, I have to make a decision. I have to make a decision. This, I'm being an analyst before I became an analyst. I have to make a decision right now if he's going to win or lose. If I'm wrong, I screwed up. And I look, I'm watching the fight. I watch a couple rounds first. Say so he's going to lose his title. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to take this right now, and I'm going to use it right here. I go over. I go over. And Mike was sitting there. I go over. I said, look, the, it's the night of underdogs. It's the night where people give up their crowns. It's the night when someone else takes the crown. And then we had about two rounds, three rounds left. And, and new chair. And the guy, I said, that's the night that it is. And I was like, I, I feel bad. I'm throwing my friend under the bus here. My yeah. friend's got the champ. But 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 it, but I, I'm not making him lose. Hey, if he had to lose it, at least he can say he but contributed. He's helping me. He's yeah, helping me. Exactly. And then, and then come the knocks on the door. And we have security, you know. And they're all coming. Teddy, can we let this guy? And they got orders. Don't let no one in. You know, because you can't have the wrong person come in at the wrong time. You know, someone who might mean well, they might not. Yeah. But they might mean well, yeah. but they might be drunk and they come in. And we don't need anything to mess up what we've done and planned. So, you know, so the, they ask, can this guy? So I, I would just go to the door. I go to the door and see who it was. Good luck, Ted. Congratulations. I say, oh, there's that congratulations again. There's that word. And I would, I couldn't help it. I tried to be better, but I'd say, we didn't do nothing yet. We didn't, yeah, but Teddy, you got here. I said, but, but we didn't win. Thanks. And then and it just kept up. I mean, every two minutes, it was like someone knocking on the door. Teddy, congratulations. Oh, Teddy, good luck. Teddy, good luck. Good luck. Like they wanted, they were, people are good. People follow something that is a story that, they hope it has a happy ending for the most part. There's some people that are, you know, hoping that the wolf eats uh, Red Riding Hood, right? <laughs> oh, for I mean, sure. There's people out there, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. There'll always be people rooting against you. Right? But but uh, but there's ones that don't. There's ones out there that want to see the fairy tale ending. <clears throat> they, because they want to believe. Before, they want to believe that ending is <clears throat> there for them, too. That that story is there for them, too. They want to be part of it. Before we continue on on fight night, I just want to ask you about the bedtime story. The night before when he's going to sleep, what story did you tell him? I told him. I never completed the story. I told him. <laughs> he was like, Daddy, what, you know, what the fuck are you doing? I said, be quiet. I'm telling a bedtime story. There's the bedtime story of the kid that went to bed, a contender, and woke up a champion. And, in, you know, and I might have said a little, you know, I said a few words, a few things about the kid that came in, not sure, not believing, and then he believed, and then he was sure, and then he woke up champion. And then I, you know, that was, I think, somewhere along those lines, and then I said, good night, champ. You know, and that was pretty much, you know, that that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, um, so that was, you know, and then we get to the... So we're in the locker room, and like I said, I'm, I'm trying to just be aware of whatever I need to be aware of. And then we take the walk to the ring, you know, it comes time. And that walk can be, um, people, it, it can, you all have your own walks in life that can be difficult walks. And um, it doesn't have to be a walk from a locker room to a set of stairs to go up into a ring. Um, it, it can be, it can be all multitudes of, of different walks that you have to take to get to where maybe to where your destiny is and um and where you hope it is so that walk from the dressing room to the ring cuz once said to me cuz I want to give credit it's my thought it's my thought but cuz used to say to me it can be like somebody going to the lecture chair 
I know that's extreme and people are going to be like, Phew. but uh, we know it's not the electric chair, but it can feel like that. It can, it can feel like that kind of walk. Mm -hmm. Because you, you're you going to a place that's uncertain. You're going to a place where there's danger. You're going, going to a place where you're not completely sure what's going to happen in that place, but you know what the intent is. The intent is to hurt each other. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Oh, yeah. You know? <clears throat> so the intent is to do damage. The intent is, you know, to overcome someone else. To beat somebody else, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of that, but to beat somebody, there's danger. And, you know, so you walk in those, and, and I, I wrote a story about this one time. It, it got published in, in a couple of places, and it's in a book. Uh, the great Jack Newfield uh, put it in a collection of short stories, and it was called The uh, KGB Table Read, I think. And uh, it was a story that I wrote about. It was called "The Shadows of a Room," and it was a fictional story because I'm just. But it was. But it's real. Mm. The person in the story wasn't real, but it might as well be. It represented every fighter that ever took that walk. And in this story, it was about walking from the dressing room to the ring. And when the fighter gets out of the dressing room, he looks and it might be. Let's say it's a fifty-yard walk. Let's say it's yeah. a thirty-yard walk. <clears throat> It looks like it's 30 miles. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's a mile instead of yards. Mm -hmm. it, that's because of the pressure, because of what it represents, because of the uncertainty, because of the fog that obscures your vision. What fog? The fog of doubt. The fog of fear. And so, you, so we're going, we're taking our walk. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm watching everything. Watching everything, keeping people, uh, the camera's got to stay in front of you. Keep, I, I, I slammed the camera a couple of times. <laughs> like, like, I could just imagine. Yeah, like, like you, you, you stay back far, you know, you, you don't be bumping into us. Don't, don't make anything feel like it was wrong. Mm. Don't obstruct our rhythm right now. Don't do anything that. Don't inject yourself into yeah, our situation. Yeah. Just be a spectator. Yeah, yeah, be what you're supposed to be. Don't screw this up. Yes. I ain't letting you. So I was a bull, you know, the guy was like, whoa, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I'm watching, oh, and we're going, and here we are. We're going. We're going, you know? And um, all of a sudden, I, I could feel the guy was walking too slow. And I just felt it. I just felt it. I said, I looked at Michael real quick. And I said, he wants to go. He wants to go. And and this guy's like a race horse. Yeah, he wants to go. He wants to go. And this guy's holding us up. So I freaking say to the guy, I said, You better start moving. You better <laughs> because you're gonna get run over. And I turned to Michael, I said, Come on. I said, Go ahead, let's go. And I started running. I started jogging. And Michael starts jogging because that's what he wanted. That yeah, I just yeah, felt yeah, it yeah. like like he, he wants to move. Yeah. You know, motion relieves tension. Oh, I know exactly. You know what, what I mean? There's a reason why uh, expecting father, uh, you know, in the maternity ward is walking up and standing down the aisle. There's a reason. Yeah. And nature tells him, relieve that tension. So uh, nature told me, you know, I, I said, we, we got to move. So I look at Michael. I said, let's start, let's start jogging. And Michael said, let's go. And, and there we are. We're, everyone's calling in the camera. And, you know, he, he, hey guy, that poor guy's probably getting his instructions he, from the director. He, and you're you know, telling him, go, he, he, go. He, he's crapping his pants. Because yeah. he, you know, he, I, you know, he's like, oh, <laughs> you know, because we're going to run on. And I'm really going to run him right over. Yeah. Run him right over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so here we are. We run into the ring. And we get up in there and we're, we're going so I'm looking around, and the weird thing is, do you remember back in those days? We're going back what 25 years. Do you remember who the hot? It was the hot, whatever it was, rap, whatever, hip hop. But it was the hot guy was MC Hammer. Do you? Remember I was him? just gonna say MC Hammer. <laughs> he was the hot guy, and he had a song called "Can't Touch This." Do you remember? Oh, well, like it was yesterday. Guess who his biggest fan was? Guess who loved that song? Guess who asked? Me to buy him MC Hammer pants. <laughs> my son, my seven year old son, oh, right. he loved MC Hammer. That is and, funny. And he had his pants, those those pants that he yeah made, yeah those yeah, pants, yeah whatever they were. And my son would my son would he, he would like sometimes I'd come in hey how you doing buddy you know and my son would be 
<laughs> can't touch this. <laughs> can't touch this. I say, whoa, whoa, you got quick. You can't touch this. And and I said, yeah, you, you that, that, is that you, Ted, or is that MC Hammer? <laughs> can't touch this. So here we are, and who's in there? Freaking can't touch this. I say, I'd be damned if we can't. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, and I remember just so, uh, and Michael knows who he is, you know. Of course. So I turned to Michael and I said, we're going to touch it tonight. <laughs> just like that. Just like, going to touch it tonight. Yeah. And Michael's like, yeah. Yeah, going to touch it tonight. So we get up there. We get in there and there's MC Hammer. And, you know, and he's in there. I think he had those pants on too. And he, there he is. He's in the ring. And, uh, you know, I know who this guy is because of my son. And, you know, so all of a sudden I got to say something again. You know, just got to pick your words. The right ones will know when to say nothing. And uh, I turn to Michael. I say, he'll be retired after tonight. <laughs> he'll be gone too. He'll be retired after. And you know what? MC, after that fight, you never heard MC Hammer anymore. It was weird. Yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah, he, he yeah. Kind of, I guess he was fading out anyway. Yeah. But I said, uh, it, MC Hammer won't be around after tonight. He'll be retired after tonight. And then I turn around and I look at him and I'm thinking about it because the champion gets the privilege of coming out last. And um, so we're waiting in the ring. That's a big privilege too. Yeah, because you got to wait. Exactly. And what happens when you wait? More time for imagination to creep yep. in. Those ninjas to come over the wall. Get cold. And they are ninjas, baby. Yep. And there's ninjas in everyone's life. Yeah, everyone's. You got your own ninjas. And um, and they come. So we're in the ring and there's time. So, uh, you know, you got to wait. So we're in the ring. And all of a sudden I say, again, I, I got to say something. So I, I turned to Michael and I said, this will be the last time we come in the ring first. After this, we'll be the ones coming in second. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know? Oh, believe yeah, me. Yeah, All this just, stuff. Yeah, is like you know, and stuff that real boxing fans are going to recognize. Like, yeah, it's coming out for us. Sucks. You, you know, and we just, <clears throat> and and again, I'm keeping them, you know, got to keep moving. And uh, and then, and then, uh, you know, we got the man, the best referee, probably one of the greatest of all time. Uh, I think, right, if I remember correctly, Mills Lane, right? Yeah. Let's get it on, baby. <laughs> you know, serious guy, district attorney, good man, you know, great referee. and uh, All business. You know. Any questions from this corner? Any questions from this? Let's get it on. You know what I like about him? He was all business. There's another referee out there. I don't want to say his name, but he's always, like, slapping the guys on the ass and smiling and clowning. I'm like, just... Well, he was a district attorney. He was a judge. He was, I mean, this is, you know, he was, yeah. you said it. It's serious. So, you it's know. It's a serious responsibility. Don't make light of it. Like yeah. business. And and it's time to go. Before you, before you tell me about that, I want to pause for one second because I want to spend a lot of time talking about the fight itself because there's a lot of like big moments in that fight and there's a lot of interesting subplots in the way you interact with Michael. So let's pause right there for now and we'll pick up with um, part three of this series where Michael actually fights for the world title and uh, hopefully by then I'll have a voice. Thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll be back. Thanks for being with us. Oh.